you tonight. Um, we're here tonight, as you know, to celebrate the publication of Paul Carter's latest exciting book, Decolonising Governance, Archipelagic Thinking. And in the tradition of so many great book launches, we have a book launch without books. <laughs> well, in fact, we have four books, but they're not for sale. We have four books that can pass around among you and tempt you with the promise of what it might be to, to possess one, to read the whole thing, and so on and so forth. Um, we're very sorry about that, but for many of you that will come as no surprise because you know the way these things work. Um, and what we would invite you to do, if at the end of tonight you feel compelled to have a copy of this book and you would like it at a much reduced price to the price that you would buy it from Rutledge, please leave us your details. And Paul Carter is committed <laughs> to making sure one arrives into your hands at author's discount price. It's exciting, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it's an opportunity, once again, to embody the decolonising government rules of pu publication. We'll undermine the publisher and create a new community. That's the only way to That's it. So what we might do is just kind of pass a couple around and you know, feel free to flip through while, um, while we're talking. Quiz, yeah. And um, <laughs> in, in the meantime, yeah, the I, I, I will take that other book back <laughs> just to um, signal that while we don't have the latest book, we do have copies of this even just as good <laughs> and really, really interesting Paul Carter book, Ground Truthing. The, the, re the reason for this is that it's, it's a worked case study of the general principles mm. in this book. Okay. So it's not just a random sort of <laughs> out, of, out, of, out of the attic observation, but it gives you a pretty good example of how this whole thing might operate, in this case, in the Mali in Australia. Okay. So there is a reason for it. A lot of other books in the car. But, <laughs> but maybe we can leave those two uh, yeah, later in the year. So, Sorry, so there are 10 no. copies of Ground Truth things sitting in, in, 15 in fact, sitting in the room next door and again we, we would just ask if, if you feel compelled to take one, make sure you really, really, really want to read it, really it. it and, uh, because otherwise there might be someone else who really, really wants yeah. to read it and has not had the That's opportunity true. to take Good. one. So, um, so we make that offering to you tonight. Um, <laughs> At the outset, I want to acknowledge Philip Darby. I thought Philip was going to be here tonight. He, it, it appears he's not. Um, Philip, a, as most of you know, was the, um, the previous director of the Institute and he was instrumental in shepherding Paul's book through the publication process. This book is pr um, published under the Institute's um, series writing past <laughs> colonialism with Rutledge and Philip is a great friend of Paul's and a passionate supporter of his work and um, so we thank him in his absence. The way tonight's discussion is going to work is as follows. We're going to hear briefly from Paul a bit of an overview of the book and then we're... <laughs> and, and we'll be um, holding him to that. I'm good with the stopwatch. And we're then going to have a conversation in four parts, or more precisely, if you like, a conversation between Paul and four interlocutors, um, who you see before you, and the fourth I um, count <coughs> as all of you together. Um, myself, Melinda Hinkson, I'm the director of the Institute, for those of you I've not met before. John Cunningham and Priya Srinivasan in the order as we go down here. So let me begin, um, first of all, by acknowledging that we meet tonight on the customary lands of the Wurundjeri. And in making this acknowledgement, let, I want to address an elephant in the room. Tonight we're discussing a book about decolonisation, but we don't have an Australian Aboriginal speaker on our panel. Um, and you might be thinking, well, how can we be sitting here in an <coughs> institute for post-colonial studies that stakes itself as being all about a new place-based politics? How can we do that? How can we possibly take ourselves seriously without an Australian Aboriginal speaker on our panel on a topic of decolonisation? Well, in response, let me be really quite clear. Firstly, 
As Paul and I were planning the event, it was our really strong preference to have him in discussion with um, a, a well-placed Indigenous interlocutor. As this event is to be focused on Paul's work rather than decolonisation in general, that presented us with a particular challenge. It meant we were looking for somebody who was familiar with Paul's work, who was engaged with Paul's work, and ideally was engaged with Paul's work in the place-based project work that he does and that he has done in Darwin, um, in, in Perth most recently, in, in Alice Springs. <coughs> And in the end, the challenge of bringing such a person to be here with us tonight just proved to be logistically too complicated on this occasion. So some of you have um, come along to a series of panels that we hosted last year on the fault lines to coexistence and collaboration. And you'll be aware that those discussions uh, featured very, very strong and lively discussions between Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal speakers around themes of treaty, around themes of collaboration and around themes of co uh, uh, coexistence. We will continue to host those discussions into the future. We'll continue to host a whole series of differently configured kinds of panels that engage these themes. But tonight we're giving our attention to Paul Carter's take on the theme. And like all of his works, decolonising governance presents us with myriad beguiling lines to follow up. And we have two exceptionally well-placed um, people on our panel to explore some of these lines with us. So let me introduce this panel of seafaring companions for Paul's archipelagic adventure. Paul Carter, as most of you know, is an internationally acclaimed writer, poet, designer and artist. Among many of his books are several that have staked the ground for what is really a distinctive Australian post-colonial scholarship, especially the award-winning The Road to Botany Bay, The Lie of the Land, and Meeting Place, The Human Encounter <laughs> and the Challenge of Coexistence. And Paul's theoretic and poetic work, theoretical and poetic work, informs a series of public design and placemaking projects that he has worked on, as I've said before, in Melbourne, Darwin, and most recently in Perth with the award-winning Yagan Square. We also welcome John Cunningham. John is head of creative places at the City of Melbourne, where he provides curatorial vision and strategic leadership on art in public places and the role of creativity in infrastructure projects. But Paul is here tonight, sorry, John is here tonight in his private capacity as a very good friend and interlocutor of Paul's um, in all sorts of other contexts. Previously, John was director of the McClellan Sculpture Park and Gallery, as well as the Warrnambool Art Gallery. Welcome to, to Priya Srinivasan, an artist and interdisciplinary performance scholar. Priya's work brings together lively bodily performance with visual art, interactive media and digital technology to think about archives of the body, migration and female labour. And Priya's work has been presented in diverse settings internationally. Some of you will have been fortunate to attend one of Priya's performances, perhaps even here, associated with her award-winning book, Sweating Saris, Indian Dance as Transnational Labour. Please come through. There are some more seats. And finally, um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Melinda Hinkson. Um, I am director of the Institute and I'm also an anthropologist with um, uh, long-standing research relations in uh, several Aboriginal communities, most particularly Walpuri communities of Central Australia. So please make everyone welcome, and I'm going to hand over to Paul, who is going to kick us off. Well, thank you very much, Melinda, for the invitation to uh, present this book and have a discussion about it this evening. And I also acknowledge uh, the land and its custodians. Um, not only a recognition of a continuing presence, but also of a direction into the future, um, which 
really depends on the renegotiation of an unceded sovereignty. So <clears throat> that's a somber but serious note on which to begin. Um, the book itself um, comes out of a series of um, collaborations and engagements with different communities around the country and also internationally. And the core of it is the growing recognition that there was a mismatch between the ways in which uh, people who valued local knowledge as foundational as the provision of the law um, found themselves in contact with um, people often of very good will whose language came out of um, politico administrative normative um, planning, whether it was in the, the realms of uh, bureaucratic report writing, whether it was to some degree in the realms of stereotypes produced by journalism, I began to notice that there was a fundamental uh, failure of exchange between discourses that were poetic in the profound sense of embedding the truth about uh, a culture, cultural reality in story, and of course in stories enactment, which can be in a four-dimensional way, not obviously just through writing, but through body, through exchange and so forth. And this flattened out administrative logic, with which we're all familiar. Um, it's the logic of Benthamite government, which in a kind of uh, sort of ossified form we find throughout our social uh, systems and, of course, throughout our sort of political rhetoric. So I would notice that in these projects I was involved with, um, one started off in Tamil Nadu looking at uh, a post-disaster rehabilitative uh, ecology project. Another was looking at work I did up in uh, Darwin with a number of different regional communities around the question of um, what we might call distinctive coastal ecologies. And a third, which was inland in regional western district um, Victoria, was the, the waste that was occurring and also the the, the, the loss of spirit, the anomia, if you like, that was occurring in communities that were holders of this important information uh, when they came up against uh, what I called metaphorical or cultural illiteracy. Um, so with the best will in the world, the water authorities, or it might be uh, a regional government through a local agency, would want to engage with indigenous knowledge and they would be fascinated by you know, totemic stories, whatever it might be, or the, the way in which um, ecological or energetic energy forces were anthropomorphized, but really had no understanding or no capacity to, to come back with stories of their own origins, uh, with stories that embodied metaphoricity um, in the, the transition from one state to another in the negotiation of political, social, and economic change. Um, so that was one aspect of it. And decolonizing governance then grew from that because it occurred to me that if we were going to come up with bi, multi, and polycultural approaches to the maintenance of complex environments, then it was essential that governance needed to be rethought poetically. There needed to be new systems of translation between these different ways of narrating the world if we were to find common ground. So the book talks, as you can imagine, extensively about the theoretical problems of the commonplace, um, issues about comparative, comparative, comparativeness, about, in, uh, about commensurability and so forth. But at the heart of it, the argument is that the, the, the ambiguity of the metaphor itself embodies difference in the very process of identification. But the other aspect of it was completely left field and was equally interesting to me. And it was the, it was the, the intellectual but also geographical figure of the archipelago. If you're going to be talking about um, sort of getting beyond white fellow biodiversity preoccupations towards a much broader holistic understanding of environments in their, their human faithfulness, um, it's probably also important to try to overcome the continentalist bias of the map and of Western cartography more generally, which has always privileged, obviously, territory over ocean. Ocean has only ever really existed as a kind of um, a sort of valueless metaphor. In other words, a vehicle for getting from one territory to another. So I was interested in trying to say, well, if you want to, to relocate um, governance practice and principle, uh, maybe a geographical relocation is also valuable. 
So instead of thinking about dry thinking of land or, for that matter, the wet thinking of the sea, let's think about the archipelago. And I drew out three principles. I'm very excited by this. If you're, if you're a non-mathematician, as soon as you start to understand these principles uh, of topology, it's, it's breathtaking. You know, and you had a great time the other year in Zurich listening to real, real scientists talking about topology. Says, yes, 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 this is the archipelago. So the archipelago has some interesting principles from the point of view of governance. Uh, one is it has no islands which is quite nice. And the other is it has no edge. And the third is you can never get to the end of it. So this is very good for a, 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 a governance principle of becoming, which is based on the enactment, the regular enactment, the regular reinvention of metaphoric modes of knowledge. Um, there are no islands in the archipelago for the simple reason that the archipelago is a figure of relationality. So the archipelago consists of ports or islands as openings. Um, and you can have a lot of fun with Renaissance cartography to demonstrate that. Um, the island has no edge, which is um, of great embarrassment to the Japanese, I might say, who are constantly trying to put little turrets on the outermost uh, parts of their atolls in order to claim another sort of 400,000 square meters of water, because these things tend to rise and fall with the tides. Um, the archipelago is a very fluid figure. Um, you never come to the end of it. Um, my favorite example is Tristan de Kuna. This is a geographical figure, but I want you to understand it's obviously a figure about relationality, about negotiation, about the, the endless evolution of our responsibilities to deal with each other ethically through metaphor. Tristan de Kuna is always claimed to be the smallest archipelago in the world. It's fantastic. It's an impossible figure. You can never have a smallest archipelago because inside the archipelago there's a smaller one. And if you look at the maps of uh, Tristan de Kuno, the famous five islands, they contrast it with the 425,000 islands of the Finnish archipelago. Inside the five islands, there are other islands. Every island has an island inside it. It's great. You just look. The more you scale it up, and then before you know where you are, you have a kind of swarm of little islands. I won't indulge this further, except to point out that archipelagic thinking has the same quality. And what I'm saying is the archipelago is a figure of thought. It's a figure of complexity. Um, it's a useful uh, vehicle for abstraction and pattern making across many, many um, discursive fields, from you know, the stock exchange to uh, the way in which uh, forest communities operate. But my point here was it also has a political and poetic aspect. The archipelago is the figure of relationality. The metaphor is not external to it. It is the condition of its existence. So. That was, broadly speaking, the two angles. One was uh, these case studies, and the other was this marriage of it to uh, a fantasia about the archipelago. All right, that was beautifully succinct and gives us uh, plenty of scope to poke you and prod you. Um, the, the, the book is hugely creative in the way it works at the level of narrative. I mean, as I was reading this book, I was struck that the level of method, something that you are doing is piling story upon story upon story. And these are different kinds of stories, stories dr drawn from a myriad of different sorts of sources, whether they be from um, ancient Greece, from the poets, whether they be from ex the, uh, di journals of explorers, um, uh, indigenous accounts of world making, ethnographic material and so on and so forth. Um, there's a, the, the, the book enacts its argument in the way it, it kind of presents this material and builds it up and builds it up. And I'm sure that you're very much aware of that. I'm going to leave the work of drawing out some of these lines of creativity to my fellow panelists and in the interest of trying to help introduce the book to an audience who has obviously not read it yet, I'm actually going to play, take the position of the rather dull social scientist, which as you know I do all too well, um, and ask you to elaborate three central principles in the book. Now the first of these is, is the archipelago itself. So you've just, you've said various things about the archipelago, the figure of the archipelago as you've introduced it now. But round about the same time your book came out, I became aware of an article titled Archipelago Tax Ca Capitalism, Tax Havens, Offshore Money and the State, 1950s to 1970s. And when we put these two cases, if you like, together, your book and this article, it, it's very, very clear that the archipelagic form itself is ambiguous. 
And this is a point that you make. It's a point that runs thoroughly through the book. Um, you say, the archipelago can mould assemblages or rival autocracies. And you, you, you do a dance through the book with you know, this problem of the archipelago as form. So one strand of the book's narrative tracks with great care and nuance an argument that the potentiality of the archipelago lies not in the form per se, but in the relations that constitute it. Can you elaborate on this? Why archipelago rather than any other form? And what kinds of differently figured relations do you have in mind? Thank you very much for that question. Um, <laughs> um, it's exciting to be asked some things I said so central to you. And Melinda, I just want to say I've really been enjoying your work recently. And I think that, you know, that you know what? OK, so. Um, OK, there are a number of things about um, the archipelago figure. So let's just demystify it a bit and get something down to something fairly concrete. Um, I'll introduce the idea of the region. All right, just hold this idea of the region. Um, in an Australian context, I'll make the claim as follows, that we don't really have regional government in Australia. We have an inherited system which... Um, I, the federal system is actually a kind of modified version of hierarchical government from the centre. Um, so it comes down, as you know, through the state uh, to the local. So within a state, obviously, we have many, many local governments. Um, what would a region look like um, at a governance level? And I'll throw out the possibility it could be archipelagic. So just hold that concrete, relatively concrete thought in terms of the rethinking of the Australian constitution. Now, to go back to the figure of the archipelago. Yes, the, the archipelago is used as a literary figure. And of course, part of this book is about materialising poetics rather than investing in, in a poetics that's uncritical. Um, the archipelago is used as if it exists, in some sense. Um, in reality, one of the good things about looking at the history of its usage in geography is, as I indicated before, there is no such thing. <clears throat> All there is is, um, if you like, a, a patterning of space which is determined by various kinds of, obviously, political or, or geospatial interest. <clears throat> so on the one hand, you can have the, you know, the fetishized Canadian archipelago, or like I mentioned, the Finnish one. <clears throat> on the other hand, you can have an archipelago like the one that we've just recently been visiting in, in Malta, which, as far as I can see, has only got three islands, but I'm looking for the other 47. So the archipelago is not a fixed figure. But it is almost a fetishized figure in sort of, if you like, progressive uh, political re-theorization of post-colonial uh, opportunity. And the classic case is Edouard Glissant's um, archipelagic thesis for the Caribbean, but it is for the Caribbean. If you look closely at the geopolitics of the Caribbean, um, it's not an archipelago. It's actually a thrown out string of islands within the geomagnetic field of the United States. So when he looks about breaking out from that towards the Atlantic, <coughs> clearly it carries with it a kind of recidivism, a desire to go back to a certain sort of African polyglottalism, whatever it may be. In other words, it's a very specific historical figure. But as it so often happens with theories when they trans you know, are successful and they transfer themselves to other in environments, it's taken uncritically as a highly romantic view of the potential of of you know, multiculturalism or, like I say, polyglot discourses to somehow um, push us through culturally to a new politics. But actually, it's, it's very regional, it's very specific. And I take up some counter cases of uh, maroon societies in Venezuela and so on that have developed in very different ways. So that's one point to make. That it's, I'm trying to sort of materialize the archipelago and say there are as many governances, if you like, as there are archipelagos. Uh, the second thing is that with that figure, um, I was interested in its um, potential to act as a translator between different discourses. So, for example, if one thinks about um, the focus of this book, which is on the value of new governance methods for the management of the environment, particularly for environments that um, you know, are obviously under threat, part of the problem is the conceptualization of the environments themselves. So it's all very well to have a, and I, the, one of the case studies, a case study for Wallacea, which is you know, what originally were the Moluccas, you know, on Spice Islands. Um, and I make the point, this very well-intentioned UNESCO report, and I sort of rip it apart over about 50 pages, um, 
starts off with a whole set of territorial preconceptions which can entirely ignore the archipelagic nature of the Moluccas. So what you end up, not, not, they also entirely ignore the very complex, um, really non-indigenous actually, or incursive um, histories of association that make sense of that as a human habitat. So what I'm saying in that particular case is that if you're going to um, employ the archipelagic figure, you also need to think about the kinds of environments that you actually want to try and save. So environments, let's say for the purposes of this discussion, which are archipelagic, are amphibious. Um, it's not ocean and land. Um, if you think about the Indonesian archipelago, it's ambiguously land and water. It's atoll based, the Galapagos, you know, its evolutionary kind of fetishization is dependent on sea level rise and fall over 70,000 years. So we're dealing with environments which are inherently complex, as opposed to the simplified um, ecological models that are often used. So there is a relationship in terms of my archipelagic thinking between the way in which um, you materialize local knowledge regionally and the kinds of environment that then come into focus. Um, so there's a particular discussion about the common interests that fishing communities might have across the Arafura and Timor Seas. These are extraterritorial connections. They're local knowledges that are quite specific and invested in story. But they clearly have far more in common with each other if we talk about a creative region uh, than they do with the state authorities that are trying to handle the fishing rights for their particular areas. How, how was that, Mina? That's excellent. Thanks, Paul. So uh, another, um, a key term, if you like, and term, term is too weak a word, but um, uh, something that's absolutely central to all of your work, and again, very central in this book, is the working of metaphor. And as this is a book on decolonization, you have a very important engagement in the book with um, a, a very influential article that will be familiar to, to many of you in the room by um, Eve Tuck and Wayne Yang, decolonization is not a metaphor. Um, a number of you familiar with that work? Yes, yes, small number. So I'll just say a little bit about it. I mean, the argument in that essay is that many of the recent adoptions of the language of decolonization work at the level of metaphor and in so doing make possible a continuing set of evasions. Um, in other words, what the authors refer as settler moves to innocence. Um, they assert the incommensurability of decolonization, the possibility that decolonization is something very special unto itself and not a form of politics that's reducible to other forms of, of civil or human rights, um, a distinct and irreconcilable kind of project, if you like. And they remind us that decolonization is and must be unsettling, that it finds no equivalence with reconciliation, for example. Um, they write, there are three portions, sorry, there are portions of these projects that simply cannot speak to one another, cannot be aligned or allied. Now, your book and much of the Paul Carter project at large, if you like, is all about the possibility, the very possibility and the necessity of communication. So you write back quite forcefully um, to, to this argument that perhaps there's some space here for incommensurability and um, related, relatedness. Can I ask you to elaborate that on, on for, for people a little bit? It's, it's, it's the part of the book that is, is important for people who are interested in the radical politics of decolonization. And you do not skirt around that argument. You take it face on and your response has something to do with metaphor itself as itself a transformative um, possibility. Um, but something also about the very idea of incommensurability that you seem to want to push back against. Just want to thank you for that question. That's <laughs> um, okay, there are three things to say about that. One is about regionality. To 
um, is probably uh, about comparability. Um, and the third is about metaphor itself, if there is an essence. So the first is about regionality. That particular argument occurs in the context of the decolonization of Canadian indigenous people. That's mainly the main focus. Um, so it's an argument uh, against um, well-meaning and also less well-meaning kind of white fellow authorities attempting to intervene in the lives, fortunes, affairs, and lands of indigenous people in British Columbia mainly. Um, so it's itself um, a response to a very particular set of political circumstances. It comes out of an exhaustion with this endless expectation of white authorities that you will hand over your stories <coughs> um, and in return for that um, re retrieve virtually nothing of your spiritual, let alone economic heritage. So they say, no, we're fed up with this kind of conversation. It goes nowhere. It's always in the hands of people who aggregate power to themselves precisely you know, in the terms I was suggesting, that is through bureaucratic mechanisms. Um, second thing is that um, the point I try to make in the book is that incommensurability is a fine thing, um, but it doesn't prevent you from comparing. So comparativism is perfectly possible. Um, and in fact, one definition, it's Marcus's definition of it, is very much that comparison is important where you don't have a language in common. Um, so there are many stories I give of um, local knowledges uh, emanating from different parts, as I say, of uh, northern Australia, or it might be Western District, and certainly uh, across between Indonesia, India, and, and northwest Australia, where local knowledges are clearly not commensurable in the sense you can't simply take out uh, one anthropomorphic ancestral creation figure who has a particular set of responsibilities and say, oh, well, that's the same, you know, in a kind of 19th century diffusionist model. You can't say, well, that, that, that entity is the same as the entity that's held as, as to be important, much the Yawuru of Broome, for example. But what you can obviously see is the comparison. And the comparison works at the level of regional exchange. So on those occasions where indigenous leaders, for example, are working together on a common problem, usually in that case it's to do with declining fishing, uh, fish levels and so on, they're able to compare harmoniously and easily their knowledges. But no one is going to say that they're commensurable. Um, there will be blind spots across these different sort of poetic ecological traditions, um, and the challenge is indeed to find the points of crossover and comparison. That challenge is necessitated by uh, the fact that we're operating in an industrial, post-industrial um, environment of extreme exploitation of the world's resources. Um, it is not, um, in my view, a sensible or manageable position to withdraw and say, no, well, we're just not going to talk to you anymore. The question is, do you want to carry on that conversation in terms that do justice to the incommensurability of your local knowledge and your experience, bearing in mind that that local knowledge contains the cosmos? as all our spiritual systems do. They're all metaphoric systems for trying to, if you like, um, nest within the particular aspects of the general. The third thing is really about metaphor in this context. Um, the key figure in the book in terms of a theory of metaphor is, of course, Paul Ricoeur. And I don't really go much beyond his theory of the metaphor. It works very well for me. I think he's an extraordinary philosopher. But one of the points he makes is relevant to the book. He says, Consider a simple statement like um, um, the tree is a cloud. Um, it's not bad. We can all see that. You can see the green foliage. You can see it, you know, silhouetted against the sky. It looks like a cumulus cloud. This is a metaphor. It's a metaphor. And he says, what, what is interesting about the metaphor is it draws your attention to the fact that it's not true. It is because it is not. That's the essence of a metaphor. It is precisely because at another level, which is the level of you know, managerialist, politico administrative language, it's not true. It would not pass muster in the law court. <coughs> and yet, as you know, in traditional knowledge systems, whether they come, from, come down to us through the European tradition, through the American tradition, or the Australian tradition, um, they build entirely around the is, is not ambiguity. Um, you know, the rainbow is a particular kind of spirit creature. No, it's not. 
Well, it is. Okay, that's the beginning of the exchange. Do you get it or don't you get it? And of course, it is, it's really boring unless it reaches out to comprehend an entire set of culturally approved associations that add up to an entire poetic ecology. At that point, it becomes science. It becomes scientific because it works. It works empirically, it also works socially. So the metaphor is very important when we go back to the question of uh, commensurability. No, there will never be commensurability if you have two tectonic plates of theory uh, thrust up against one another. But if you realize that internal to both of them is the is-is-not conundrum, then it's an archipelago. The island only exists in the archipelago as a neighbor. It only exists because it's not an island. It's the same metaphoric principle. So um, I, I was finally going to ask you a little bit about exchange rates, which, which leads on very nicely from, from where you've been talking now. Exchange rates, again, folk, folk, uh, feature very centrally in, in your um, figuring of, of the meeting place, of what happens when two commensurable or in, incommensurable peoples come together. Um, and you give us this idea of, very kind of seductive idea of the good exchange rate that sits there as this kind of empty possibility, this potential, if you like. I think um, th this is something that, that many of us are struggling with at the moment. How do we establish something that might approach the idea of a just and good exchange rate from the position that we are in the present? I mean, you've you, you've, you've alluded to the environmental crisis. We're um, all aware that the very foundations of, of the nation rest on, if you like, the antithesis of a good exchange rate. They, they, they rest upon theft. Um, so how do you get... I mean, you, uh, th this is now just finally... I'm not asking you to solve the most difficult problem for us, but for somebody who has worked on the ground with communities... As, on tangible placemaking projects, trying to bring planners and local communities who are very, very differently invested in place together. How do you go about that first move towards something approaching a good exchange rate? Just want to thank you for that question. Remarkably, <laughs> 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 Obviously, I need to talk to my agent. <laughs> <laughs> um, OK, so start at the end and work backwards, I think. Um, you were talking about the uh, enriched and sort of renovated agenda for the Postcolonial Institute. And you talked about, in a sense, place-based knowledge, knowledges that are situated both you know, politically and environmentally. Um, so one of the things that comes up when you, when you find yourself working both with government and also working with communities uh, in this area called place um, is, again, it's, it's a shifting term. So there's a fetishized place, which is really a microcosm of the territory, which is the way that planning works. Or there is another kind of place, which doesn't exist except in the exchange. So we'll call it placing. So placing is the transaction that occurs when, in, in an idealized situation, two people approach, um, or when the mother gives birth to a child placing occurs. So primary neighboring or primary relationality exists in the dyad. It's not, there's never a sovereign individual. There's only somebody who's in the echo of the other, in the shadow of the other. So that's the primary dyad, if you like, in my view. And that's called placing, in my view. So if you start to think about placing, then it's not something that you get to at the end of a satisfactory exchange. Uh, you know, where you, you write the wrong and you say, well, we'll pay you that amount of money or we'll make sure that we don't you know, rape the land. It's actually the, it, it's the constitution of the human relation. So the act of placing is endless, like the archipelago is endless. The voyaging, the steersmanship that's required to, to navigate these regions of common care is endless. So in that model, the dyadic model, the model where relationality is plural, obviously, in origin, as it is in you know, many literary traditions as well as um, um, cosmic traditions, the, na the navigation of the exchange turns into an ethics and an aesthetics of encounter. Um, and I always see it quite physically as choreography. 
So, but choreography is not just being able to dance on the spot. It's also about um, the echoic mimicry that's involved in self-production in any community. Um, it starts off with the, the parent-child relation, which itself is embedded, I think, within the echoic environment of, of, of natural sounds and, and affordances. But within that idealis idealized model, um, the exchange rate is something that is not fixed from the outside, it's fixed from the inside of the uh, observational transaction. It's, it occurs imitatively, it occurs accretively, and it occurs through memory. And it becomes institutionalized, like grammars do in language, and it's therefore capable of renegotiation from the inside. Um, that's quite an exciting possibility. But it doesn't give you free fall to invent. It means that whenever um, the, what I'll call the performative exchange rate is subjected to modification, it can be through disaster, it can be through violence very often, uh, then it's necessary to renegotiate the exchange rate. But the exchange rate itself is not exterior to uh, the, um, if you like, the, um, the, the navigation of a place. It's not like we can get in. You know, the Tenderum ceremony is a very interesting example of that, which is, you know, it's not about access to territory, it's about the rates of exchange for passage. And as you know, sort of, I was going to fetishize this term passage, maybe it's a sort of, you know, kind of migrant privilege, but I'm very interested in how passage passing with the idea of mortality, le pas as the pace or the footstep, is also the orientation. These kinds of movement form um, are to me, um, should we say, a relational topology, which is important in understanding how we decolonize uh, the territorialization of human relations. I'll pass the baton to John. Is it on? Oh, sorry. Um, thanks, uh, Linda. Thanks, Paul. Um, it's an honor to be here. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, I do tend to speak fast when I'm uh, nervous. Um, I'm here as a friend of Paul's. We've known each other and argued for 800, well, eight years, but our uh, Atlantic archipelago have been arguing intensely for thousands of years, and, and certainly for the last 800 years, as I suppose an Englishman and Irishman colonizer and colonized, um, and just the intensity of that relationship. Um, and also then, sort of, some Priya were just talking about this, that we both come from post-colonial uh, societies, and then we're dropped, I'm dropped into the western districts of Victoria, uh, into a colonized society, and how do I deal with that in another type of colonization? Um, because the, the, the experience of post-colonization especially for our nations, has been very traumatic and continues to be traumatic. Um, Ooh, sorry. Um, I, I, when you contemplate the western districts of Victoria, so that's from Cape Otterway, east to Mount Gambia, up to sort of uh, the Grampians, you see that in um, hydrological terms, and not merely geographical, which I think is really interesting, as you call it, the system of flows and catchments. Uh, so redefining the human landscape and unconstrained by those engineering divisions and, and constantly changing its surface arrangements and relative uh, positions. Here, I think you refer flows refers to the Aboriginal storylines and catchments to their great meetings. Um, on this, and you take inspiration, and as do I, from James Dawson's work, uh, the Scottish uh, squatter, uh, advocate for local government reform and co-author of the uh, Australian Aborigines, 1881 with his daughter, I think an even more astonishing person, Isabella. Um, but could you talk to us a little bit about the Bureau of Research in Dawson on their idea of the translations of the Aboriginal languages? Um, um, how you see what they, what you call their moral, an or what they call their moral anecdotes as hyper stories? Um, uh, Aboriginal meta-narratives uh, that, that about the discursive foundations of, of being relating to the importance of the socio-economic custom of uh, Yuraka Barwar and the dramaturgical sort of exchange in Aboriginal societies then? First of all, I just want to express my delight that Philip's here. <laughs> <laughs> Apologies, I hadn't noticed you were here before. Your presence was so omnipresent that it hadn't been materialised in the body, so that's good you know. Um, yeah, look, one of the, so one, one part of the book deals, 
I thought, you know, archipelagos are also thought to be oceanic because I thought, well, let's just turn this on its head and we'll do an inland archipelago. And so the, the, the very simple argument of that part of the book is saying, OK, let's have a look at an Australian example, which is uh, pretty close to Melbourne. Um, and I was looking at the Western District, which is actually a relatively well-defined, not very, but relatively well-defined um, sort of biogeographical zone. And it's often invoked... Um, both in political but also uh, in educational discourse and so on. You know, Deakin lays claim to it and so on. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and so they should. Um, so you've got this relatively well-defined region, but it doesn't have a government. Um, and what it does have is, a, is, you know, is a plethora of local authorities. And as John was indicating, uh, an overflow, should we say, of, of, of a regional infrastructure authorities, you know, water, electricity and so on. Um, so I got very interested in um, the ways in which um, the regionality of that region um, were being um, either uh, unrealized uh, or unrepresented, particularly in the context of early colonial uh, recognitions of it as a region. Um, so this wasn't uh, an Aboriginal argument, it wasn't an ethnographic argument, it was an argument about a progressive politics emanating from immigrant communities into the Western District. Um, so the reason this became interesting was, just as John mentioned, there was this <coughs> figure that some of you will know, uh, James Dawson, who um, was an interesting humanist in the sense that um, he not only worked a, in a very interesting way with his daughter, on the collecting of, of idiolects, individual speakers of two languages or related dialects, Gundijmara and Jaburung from the southwest of Victoria. But he co combined that with a concerted project to develop regional literacy. So um, he was a, an expert in soil improvement. He was an advocate for the humane treatment of animals, farm animals particularly. Um, he had created his own museum which would show regional instances of local fauna and flora. He was instrumental in getting artists, which whom he commissioned, to represent the Western District. Um, so von Gerab was one of the people he commissioned. He was instrumental in establishing nature reserves um, um, in uh, Mount Rouse and also down um, around uh, Warrnambool. Um, and he wrote ceaselessly about the importance of understanding uh, the... Uh, knowledge, the regional literacy invested in the long Aboriginal um, inhabitation of that country, mediated through, obviously, through uh, their political economy, um, but also through their, um, you know, the eel industry, which um, he and then later on Lorandos, working off his, off his information, could show to be um, a regional economy. So that regionality became very interesting to me because here was an example within uh, the immigrant or the colonial community of an awareness of a, of a progressive regional politics that is not represented elsewhere. It's not represented in the ethnographic literature, which at that time tended to be produced by you know, missionaries or surveyors, others who only had, had a tangential interest um, and usually a kind of prurient interest in seeing whether we could make those grammars fit ancient Greek or Sanskrit, whereas he was genuinely identifying with brothers and sisters on the soil. Quite hierarchical. He was employing them as, as maids or as workmen, but he saw them through to the end. It became a genuine partnership within what you might call second wave colonization. So all of that interested me a great deal. But what became interesting, but very briefly, because we know a lot about this, is the resistance we found um, at the local authority level to the recognition of this heritage. And you, you guys know about it too, because we work together on this too. And it was very interesting that you could, you could talk about the fact you could not separate, you know, and you know too, Mike, you couldn't separate um, Hamilton from Camperdown, uh, from uh, Warrnambool, from Ballarat, uh, from Geelong. These were all places that worked across a confederacy, not just of Aboriginal nations, but also across a confeder confederacy of shared storylines. And these storylines were partly hydrological, uh, partly geological, uh, they were certainly economic and genealogical. There was overwhelming evidence for this, but it, was, it had no place in the cultural landscape or the, or the rhetoric of cultural regional development. So I spent a lot of time sort of um, trying to interest people in this, and it was interesting that there was no possibility of doing this because it was an archipelagic uh, 
vision of the creative region. Nobody could take ownership of it. And as we didn't have you know, those concepts of neighboring or relationality or exchange at the heart, but instead a, a nuclearized competitive economy and um, you know, uh, procurement process, we found ourselves uh, frustrated. Um, so I spent quite a lot of time studying why that was, what the mechanisms of that were. Um, and that's what led you know, to this, this analysis and saying, well, you can have inland archipelagos that are also occluded. It's not just that the offshore archipelagos are seen to be politically insignificant, so are the inland ones. Absolutely. Um, you take sort of David Rose's idea of structuring principle of the Aboriginal system. It's not one of domination like European colonialism, but it's much more of a sense of um, egalitarian mutuality. Um, and you argue that the Aboriginal occupation of the country is not defined purely in terms of their longevity of, of both place here, but rather when their sustainable practices and kind of associated philosophies to place. Um, so even Dean Dawson's great revelation was actually the Gunjan Damaro were, were made themselves of the place. Yeah, you know? yeah that's true. Yeah. Um, but yet the notion of this m mythopoetic Aboriginal imagination um, uh, of place-made stories, and it takes fluency across uh, different uh, regimes, topological, cultural, uh, performative, was systematically destroyed in what you call an act of cultural and poetic genocide. Now, th th that statement alone can be quite confronting to a lot of Australians. Do you want to take us through what you mean by that systematic, poetic genocide? Yes, they, I mean, those, some of those statements um, are made in a broader mm. kind of theoretical perspective context. Um, it, I wouldn't want to give the impression that I was trying to explain to Aboriginal Indigenous people and that's how their culture works. It's, it's not, not the goal, but it's to, to make some observations across... Oh, yeah, no, I, I don't think you're doing that, yeah. yeah, yeah. But, um, um, well, the very simple example is the, is the uh, outrage that Dawson expresses that the local authorities um, in uh, Warrnambool um, forbid a group of Jaburung people on his property from holding corroborees. Um, so there's a whole discourse around why is it that 19th century white Australians thought corroborees were theatrical performances put on for the benefit of the local governor and failed to recognise that they were fundamental um, um, exchange rates uh, performances. Why, was, why were they depoliticised in that way? But that's an example of um, censorship <coughs> at the level of the, perf the performative renewal of attachment to place. Um, and it has precise, it's not, it's, it, it shouldn't be ethnicized or racialized in a curious way. I mean, the country I come from did exactly the same thing to the villagers from the village where I came from. In the 19th century, uh, people were forbidden to sing in the pubs. It was seen, this rowdyism was seen to be potentially revolutionary. It's exactly the same thing as being told you couldn't speak Irish in the schools. You know, all that stuff you know about, we talked about it. The same, yeah. Many people in this room have the same experience under colonialism in different countries. So this was a systemic attempt to impose the Benthamite model of you know, rational, rationality uh, on a diversity of cultures. Um, but the radical um, impact on a culture that had developed this unbelievably sophisticated, four-dimensional, uh, praxi praxeological philosophy, in other words, it's dependent on the reenactment of relationship, was uh, obviously um, traumatic. Um, so yes, you can talk. I mean, yes, there was a, uh, a consistent attempt to uh, silence. Um, and the silencing wasn't done just by violence. The silencing was done by the imposition of a non-metaphoric discourse. So, um, and I've quoted many examples. I'm not sure in that book, but there are many, many examples where um, colonial observers or listeners will overhear Aboriginal speech and, and, and describe it as being like music or as being like the sighing of the wind. And these are very distressing, obviously. And these are metaphors on the verge of an intention to extinguish. Um, so this is painful territory, but it's also the case. So there is cultural and poetic genocide, which is not at the level of the bruta brutalities that, you know, all societies seem to, in general, and others, they scapegoat. It's actually happening discursively, mm. saying, well, we don't value, or we cannot, we, we are basically, uh, in terms of a sensuous knowledge, going to be illiterate. 
And therefore, that deafness translates eventually. Uh, when you have you know, uh, technological power to hand uh, and the right of violence, uh, it, does, it does lead to the extinction of the other. Or at least it goes underground. Yeah, so this, this I suppose, uh, <coughs> it's a special that poetic metaphor. Um, you write that the Australian Federation was not built uh, on the language of the unity of, of, of diversity. Uh, which is celebrated by the later sort of, um, you know, uh, orthodoxy, but actually you say it's the unity of sameness. <laughs> yeah. And that's very much the, the, what we're yeah. doing. So the unity of sameness is the idea in the Western districts we have all these uh, local authorities who are not communicating together because of the idea of competition rather than actually sort of uh, um, uh, the idea of, of solidarity. Um, Dawson writes that the river may have one name but the tributaries all have little individual reaches, yeah. uh, which each have name. And this is distinction you make between uh, the continuous stream and the local reach, I think is at the very heart of your notion yeah. of what a hydrological, anthropologic uh, state of communication in a decolonizing regime could be. Mm. Um, you make a distinction between a region defined as a subordinate unit of the nation state, the local authorities down there, and a translocal uh, curative region was subject to laws of accident. Uh, you conclude the chapter by writing that only the latter, the animated poetic spaces, open up as change spaces. I think you use um, can decolonize governance. Can you just talk a little bit about sort of um, your notion about the creative region? So we 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 understand the complexity of the LGAs and their competitive model, but your counter model of the creative region and how that can actually work and. Yeah. Well, maybe um, rather than going just into that, I was thinking when you were talking about a related thing. Um, so John and I have talked quite a lot about of the obvious parallels between uh, the, the colonization of the Western District and the progressive, much longer term colonization of Ireland. And the, you know, the, the parallels, of course, are endless. But I looked for another parallel, because one of the things that just was brought up very briefly is the gendering of this landscape and the gendering of what this new governance might look like. Um, so a consistent th theme through this book um, is that um, a, a government that um, takes account of these um, relational non-hierarchical reciprocities uh, will probably derive its, its main uh, wisdom and information uh, from women. So one example is given. So women, not, not as individuals, but if you like, as um, transgenerational repositories of a certain kind of experience, which is entirely uh, sidelined, even when um, male writers you know, pay homage to it. So one example of this was the Kaliak. So we were talking about this. So uh, Dawson um, writes about the white woman in the Western District, and she's a, a shamaness figure. And he treats her with a certain amount of um, frivolousness, uh, he, but he gives a pretty good account of her skills. Um, but she has an exact uh, um, parallel in the, the, um, the strong women of Ireland, and in particular the archetypal strong women, the Kaliak. And we've talked about this. Now what's interesting about that figure in terms of the creative region is that the region is created. It's not something that somehow exists as a repository. It's not like a machine that you can sort of you know, put more fuel into and it will start going again. Uh, it is constantly being produced. And so the shaman figure is producing this through a set of spells or principles which are no different from the laws that we lay down, that, you know, drive on the left-hand side of the road or whichever it is. These are our mythopoetic principles of group formation and, and um, uh, ideation that make possible a pattern that will work as a model of the universe, as a model of human relations and what lies beyond. So the Kaliak in Ireland is very much a pre-enclosure figure, as you might imagine. So she has domination, uh, not so much over the woods, interesting, but, but very much over the, over the rocks and the rivers, yeah, and over the coastlines and so on. And so her allies, if you like, will be the witches, will be the local healers, the healer women and so on, which you can find in every society. But the real point here is that the creative region is understood as a set of hotspots or fires where this work is being done, this work of healing is being done, this work of law giving and law taking is being done. So it's an archipelagic, non-enclosed environment which continually springs up. Um, so again, it's hard to say where it starts and finishes, and it's hard to say that um, its rules are fixed. They are um, their local knowledge, 
they're situational, they're interactional. Um, it then starts to relate very much to you know, the, the, the discursive figure we have in the Western sciences, which is psychoanalysis. So it starts to say, well, okay, how do we understand the dream work? Because um, most of this kind of um, laying down of the law, sharing and performance, usually will be authenticated by certain kinds of collective dream. But that's another whole discourse. But the real point there is that the issue that was arising around the creative region and its production in the Western District was not simply a question of identifying the storylines, of which there are endless across all different cultures. Storylines are not just um, you know, uh, an exclusive privilege of Aboriginal people. You only have to look at the power lines driving right across the Western District to see one of the most powerful storylines in the world. How do we actually understand that mythopoetically and start to work with it creatively with a view to some kind of principles of sustainability? So that was the thing. And th these, these, um, um, these landscapes have their... Um, shall we say, historical parallels and cultural parallels across different countries. Thank you. Brilliant. Thanks so much for inviting me to be here on this evening. Um, Were you going to pull out the chair? Um, so... It's uh, great that I finally get to meet you, Paul, after all these years, only because I was trying by email for seven years to meet you, and it took me to read your book again so we could actually have this conversation. So just an answer in a while. <laughs> I wanted to um, just say how exciting it is to know your history with um, my uh, guru, the dancer that I grew up with in Richmond, Dr. Chandrabhanu, who helped sort of formulate my thinking around many of the questions you're asking in your book, um, particularly because this question of what your, I feel one of the greatest contributions of all your work, but in this as well, is the privileging of the arts and the humanities, especially in the ways that they're being pushed over and destroyed at the center of our questions. And <clears throat> to actually, I see creatives of color in the room here, who are all, I think, also wondering how can some of the ideas in the book be useful and put into effect? Many of them are already doing it, but I think it would be great if you could just speak to a few kinds of moments in the book um, where you actually use these stories, where you're thinking about the praxis and the enactment of what is actually possible. Um, and one particular for me that really triggered a lot of thinking around it was your Yolnu story um, where the work that I've done with um, indigenous women in the far north and in the Warrnambool, Gun the Gunditjmara women too, well, we've looked at what it means to look at Indian and indigenous stories of decolonizing. How do we decolonize differently and similarly together? Us as Indian migrants who uh, have come to Australia, how have we rethought our migrational processes and where are the models that exist for prior forms of relational exchanges? Um, because in the Australia-India exchange space, we've seen evidence of 4,000 years, archaeological evidence, linguistic evidence, embodied experience of a non-settler colonial model that's a possibility. So this is something that's very interesting to me at the bodily level of how do we actually look at that. It's okay. Uh, it just reminds me that um, when last time I was in, in Perth, I was working with um, some Nunga friends, and uh, there was uh, a woman sitting on the government side, I think it was Tamil. And so one of the guys gets up and he says, What's your mob then? Because, of course, they said, Oh, he says, Well, you're one of us. He said, No, we, we've always connected across the Indian Ocean. Yeah, no, what, you're, what, what, what's your mom then? What are you doing? So it's not like, what are you doing here? Hey, it's, it's good to see you again. So it's, it's like Marcy and Anthony walking, you, know, just, you just walk around the toxic relationship between black and white, and you just say, there's a completely different set of operations here. But that was just an anecdote. Anyway, she was a bit taken aback, and she had to be drawn into the Nungar community. But one thing, that's a relevant point, though, because, of course, um, when you talk about... Not you, but when one talks about uh, reconciliation or exchange or translation between um, creative women of colour, particularly in these situations, 
um, it's still being done on male or patriarchal territory. It's still this notion that somehow we didn't meet before. Um, and somehow it's also predicated on what I'll call a kind of geographical reductionism. And in this geographical reductionism, there is no such concept as nearness or distance. Mm. There's only absolute break and what it produces, which is a wall. So um, the geographical distance is then um, made into an impassable barrier. And then what follows from that is the implication that any uh, approach uh, will be an invasion. It will be violent. Mm. And we can see why that is um, under... Um, our history of colonization, that's always been the case. But you can see that it's not a sustainable position because nobody just wants to live looking into a mirror their whole lives. They want to meet people, they want to socialize. This is the fundamental uh, orientation of human nature. And in the great meetings that um, John was, was mentioning, um, which I wrote about in Meeting Place, the great meetings serve as much to redistribute people to country as they do to aggregate. You know, the Freudian idea that somehow the ultimate goal of civilization is fulfilled when we all can live happily together is a nightmare. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't do it. But the idea that you might meet periodically to, to, to negotiate your difference is, of course, fantastic. But we have no mechanism for it. Uh, because I think we, have, we sit with a flattened out uh, colonialist geography. Um, so then the political role of performance becomes obvious uh, to me. And it, it's in the, the ethics of the approach. So that's why in that, the other book, Meeting Place, I make this differentiation between the meeting place and the encounter. So the meeting place is the stabilization of the encounter. So when creative women of power are coming together, to me, um, the opportunity there is to draw on their body experiences of being in and out of place, being um, however that experiential life world presents itself um, through the senses and through its cognitive um, expression is then to find uh, the beginnings of uh, shared pathways and journeys which then emerge into a third place um, but it's not to fetishize the place or to fetishize the meeting place which has already been in a sense um, obscured um, I mean one of the things you're talking about Chandra and I think we mentioned you know off stage as it were I remember working with Chandra Banu in Adelaide um, so we're moving across to you know, a very powerful male dancer, but this particular experience was one that I think has relevance to, to women working in that field as well. And I was asking him how, as um, a shaman dancer from the Bharatam Natyam tradition, who was a migrant um, from, you know, Malaysia into uh, Richmond many, many years ago, how, how he put his feet down. How did he actually put his feet down on Pinky's Flat, you know, in Adelaide in 1990? How, what, how do you do that if, you're, if your energy comes from the earth? And, you know, this is on unceded ground, of course. Um, and he talked a lot about poetic translation. And he talked about, yes, the responsibility to uh, establish exchange rates through working with the body of the country and with particular individuals. And we worked with Hussein Valamanesh, which is a very interesting experience. We worked with an Iranian sculptor who is a master of the, art, of the earth, which is a master of the art. Um, and then with a number of local uh, Ghana people. And we slowly built this conversation. But one of his answers was, just as you said, it was actually um, a bringing of a prayer. He said, I bring a spell with me. And I say that. And he said, no, you know, I'll say that. I'm not, you know, I'm not sort of um, uh, infringing on a private revelation. He just said, you know, I will, I will do that meditation. And it doesn't have to be on the physical earth, but it will be in that place. And I've seen him do it. And that, that holding there is a gift that he's bringing. He's waiting to be called. Um, you do it as a performer, I'm sure. The, the waiting to be called is presupposes the approach. It presupposes the distance from which the other comes. All of that topological vocabulary has been eliminated. And so you find, we all find ourselves stripped of our metaphoricity, our capacity. A metaphor is essentially a mode of translating between different places where you maintain the difference in the process. The tree is a cloud. You know, the, the, the women you're dealing with down in, you know, um, Gundishmara country, they might say it's a cloud. You might say it's a tree. The tree is a cloud. And, the, and the, the, the transaction will depend on how you can reach back um, into the, the, the realm of women's power. Their essential connections, if there are essential connections they can share, it's even better. But you have to step round this flattening out of the ground. That's my view. It's great. 
there was an example with um, honoring Earth. We actually looked at how do we honor Earth similarly and differently, exactly what you're talking about. How do we reconnect to the ground in really sort of um, powerful ways and wait mm. together and di separately and differently. So I, I just think there's so much potential, I mean, for it to get to creatives who really can put this into effect in a lot of uh, important ways. Um, I think it's really going to be interesting to see it translated. Yeah, we'd like to see that. <laughs> and I also I was going to ask you to maybe talk a little bit about your um, questions around human-non-human -human relations um, through the archipelagic model. I thought it was very fascinating. Um, the mangrove, the other sort of um, non, the birds, and you know, um, how you think about relationality um, with the human, non-human in the age of the Anthropocene uh, affecting itself in your concept. Well, the, the birds are a good starting point, because I always like to talk about birds. Um, um, yeah, so the, the, the human, non-human, obviously, is, is itself an artificial divide. It's, it's, a, it's a, a spectrum of bios, you know. And um, so, but nevertheless, for conventional sake, it's quite clear that um, if we're going to talk about the concept of biodiversity, then we're placing ourselves in the role of stewards and custodians of the non-human world. So that's already making a, you know, a, a division which is probably false. Um, but I um, feel that, I can't prove it, but my strong belief is that um, our sense-making capacity, um, our capacity to organize and pattern the world comes from, from the world. So I'm not, I'm not um, that interested in extremely uh, skeptical philosophies of, which are based on a, a, you know, sort of semiotic reductions within language systems. I'm much more romantic. So the birds speak to me, for example. Um, and so I'm, in terms of origins, um, they are a calling. Um, the affordances of the landscape um, are also people. Um, and you know, Aboriginal people say this as a system, but it's common sense. I mean, you can just feel this stuff. But it's in interesting how completely it's been um, repressed. Uh, I'm very interested in um, you know, how we, we um, articulate metaphorically that relationship. Um, so the non-human the non dimension is not simply um, an extended inventory of for, flora and fauna. Um, it's, it's the principle of relationality, so the flows and catchments are an expression of it. Uh, another word that I use a lot in terms of trying to translate this into something that makes sense is the humid. So I'm not really interested in endless flowing any more than I'm interested in endless statics. But the idea of a frictional exchange, which obviously is political, it's interactional, it can even be erotic, that makes a lot of sense because you can see and feel there um, the difference which also produces the communication. Um, so in terms of a biodiversity principle, what I was trying to say in the book about the Wallacea biodiversity plan um, was it ignored entirely the humid zone. Um, it used a dry academic language, even though it was extremely well-intentioned. I mean, that, that's the reason I chose it. It's a fantastic report. The number of NGOs and government authorities that, are, that had um, contributed to this UNESCO vision for the reparation of um, the Moluccas was admirable. Uh, and yet, there was no sense of the sense of things. In other words, at the end of it, no meaning attached to the salvation of these things. Um, no primary connection uh, would show the fatefulness of our future in relation to theirs. It was simply a good deed because we knew intellectually that you know, there might be more drugs there if we just looked after it a bit better. So clearly that wasn't going to get very far. So I think it's that, it was that sense that, um, they're, they're, that beyond the, uh, the intellectual argument for uh, biodiversity, there needs to be a sense-based argument. There's a point you were making for about the centrality of the humanities. So um, the relationship with the non-human, or indeed with the other generally, depends on making sense. So the hermeneutical process is, again, a bit like metaphor. It's not an external secondary act. It is what, uh, what produces the human, um, which is the condition within which we exist. So. Um, you come back, at least I come back, to the feeling that 
the nav navigation of that spectrum of neighbourliness or, or um, responsibilities or implications um, is poetic. Yeah. And lastly, I just wanted to um, ask you to speak a little bit about the migrant condition. I think it's um, really interesting in your Indonesian archipelagic example of how the various forces that have created um, you know, Muslim and Christian communities welcoming various others because they are not rooted to a sense of place and how that actually enables a migrant sensibility or a diverse sensibility of society, culture, uh, how it's being made and remade, how we can maybe think of it in the Australian context as a possibility, because we don't, we're not anywhere near that yet. I guess it's an, about your utopic questioning that you're putting as a possibility. Well, I think what I was doing there, I mean, um, I'm not qualified to, 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 to speak a great deal about the Indonesian polity, but on the visits I made there, I was very struck by the, the uh, disparity between the, the kind of, we'll call it, uh, very progressive, decentralized notion of, um, you know, many thousands of islands and certainly many island communities um, developing their own solutions to local problems um, in terms of um, um, interfaith negotiations, also between uh, immigrants and indigenous communities. So there was a very progressive line of thought there, which says, well, this is the, you know, this not only is it the largest archipelago in the world, whatever that means, but it's also um, potentially, and has been historically, the great laboratory for a different way of thinking about post-colonial politics. And it's quite interesting that Enlightenment scientists always quoted Indonesia and when they were trying to develop their own theories of evolution. They said, well, this is where evolution's happened most rapidly. Whatever we might think about that term, they were talking about uh, linguistic evolution, political evolution, even genetic evolution. But then you had the disparity between that and, of course, the, the in a sense, almost hysterical uh, centralized government rhetoric. So how, you know, how do we sort of, sort of herd all these cats? You know, there's so many different places here. So there was that contrast. So you have this, the, the double centripetal centrifugal force, which is occurring in the, in the Indonesian politics. Um, the kinds of utopic uh, thinking about hybridization, uh, drift, uh, continuous flow and growth, uh, are not um, somehow essentialized in Indonesia. They come out of particular thinkers, like Glisson, obviously most influentially. So it's, it's a geographical metaphor. It's, it's deployed in Indonesia because, in a certain sense, the, um, the, 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 the tectonic plates rub up against each other so roughly. And so if it, it is possible to find a friction theory which turns it into a positive outcome, then it's, it's significantly important. I talked a lot to managers of regional development projects there who were working with, trying to work with indigenous knowledge systems to develop uh, biodiversity management plans. Um, and it's, it was intriguing to see this um, conflict between having to um, uh, impose a kind of American-style wilderness principle on these sites uh, and a recognition that the only custodians who could make sense of this were those people who were already living there but cutting down the wrong trees. So you see that at a very local level as a conflict. Um, I don't think the situation, therefore, is different from the challenge that's faced in Australia. It's not, it's not uh, this is the archipelago as a geopolitical entity and as a, um, shall we say, as a, uh, a poetic metaphor. Um, so the issues apply equally here. Thanks very much, uh, Paul. I think I might have asked the first part of this question 10 years ago. Uh, so <laughs> catching up. Um, uh, just think about the politics of, of what you're presenting. Um, and in terms of this division, this binary between abstraction and localism. And you could map that fairly consistently on a kind of a north-south scale in terms of regimes of, of uh, the military and uh, science against uh, the mythopoetic that exists within the colonised peoples. But there are some exceptions to that. And uh, I'm thinking of the 
when Hart and Negri in Empire talk about the importance of truth in post-colonial struggles, particularly in Africa, where it may seem essentialist, but it was a necessary condition in order to galvanise a certain struggle. But even in Australia, with uh, examples of various indigenous codes um, that are developed in terms of intellectual property, uh, now the Uluru Statement and an attempt to you know, instantiate um, indigenous rights within the constitution and so on, which speaks to a certain move towards abstraction um, mm. as, as, as an action. And I'm wondering about the limits of romanticism in this case, whether it needs some sort of ethics <coughs> to overlay. Um, thinking about somebody like Victor Turner's anthropology, I mean, he saw the limits of, of, of structure in the carnival, but uh, saw the need for a dualistic model to see that there is an interplay or a, an oscillation between, <coughs> between the two. In terms of working with communities and, and bringing out some of the um, more poetic elements in the land and in history and, and so on, um, is there a kind of ethics there around the potential to choose a pragmatic solution, for instance, or uh, one that is perhaps more abstract? Um, or is, is there something absolute about the kind of romanticism for you that is necessary? Um, we'll just hold that term, romanticism. I wasn't going to use it, but you used it just before. Yeah, I know. So I, I, just, I, 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 just, I just thought, I haven't heard from you, Kevin, for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember that question ten years ago, and I thought, yeah, I'm not going to get this guy to it. Um, no, I mean, yeah, the point you make, I mean, there's quite a lot of discussion in the book about bicultural uh, land management regimes, not least ones that you know, John has been, well, John and Melinda have both been involved in. So it's not that uh, I have some kind of party pre against. Um, oh, party pre. <laughs> um, I, it's not that I have some sort of party pre against um, uh, management regimes that actively negotiate a, a pragmatic politics as well as a politics, which happens in exemplary fashion with some of the projects that, as I say, John's been, um, you know, um, well, you John guys. Altman. No, well, you, well, well yeah. Many. Yeah, John Altman has been doing. So that's not an issue. I, I don't think it's neither or, of course not. Um, it's, uh, it's like we can speak different languages. Um, it's, it's really, the, the, I think the point I'm trying to make in the book is it tends to be a one-way uh, process. It tends to be uh, Aboriginal people or people uh, with a strong um, attachment to the future of particular regions uh, are being asked to translate into the language of uh, administration. It's not happening the other way. Um, so my point was that really in terms of we're talking about the humanities, why this is a book that speaks to the humanities as opposed to anthropology, um, is that I'm saying we need to address a fundamental cultural illiteracy. In other words, it's our incapacity to understand the value of stories. As a, as a, as a, you know, we're talking about the, the, po the politics of poetics. Why is it that poetics is, you know, in Said's terms, mere literature, when actually it's a fundamental uh, discourse around um, social, environmental, and human rights? <coughs> Knowing you as I do, I'm not surprised that you bring two books along to the Lord. I hope my question is not too pedestrian, but I live in the Darabin Council, and we've got a few things, a few ways in which the councillors could benefit hugely from some acropelagic thinking at the moment. One is our new um, uh, parking strategy, which has really got the community going. And the other one is the way that we're dealing with, and I'm getting involved in thinking about how we eradicate Indian mine birds. And I know you like talking about birds, and it just seems to me that there's so much going on there in the way those birds have come and what they're being accused of doing and how they're impacting on our indigenous um, wildlife. And as I do what I've rather aggressively been doing to them, I feel quite I'm asking a lot of questions confronted. Yeah. yeah. How would I acropologically think about that? What was <laughs> That's easy. <laughs> 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 you can go to the Darabin Council and you can spend, you know, you can do a half day workshop on how to dispose of them. And I won't go into the work, but it's been experimented with in the Darabin Council. But you can also take it to your local vendor and they will dispose of them in a more humane way. But they've come, they've arrived, they're not native, and there's a lot of angst about 
the, mi the miners. But yeah, but what about what about the parking problem? What sort of <laughs> <laughs> we haven't yet had any veterinary interventions there. No, I can say, are you are, are you trying to era eradicate parking spots? <laughs> Oh, parking inspectors, sorry, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, the, if you were actually to take that on as um, a community project, it's, just, it's a classic public art project that, where you bring together a community and say, okay, let's actually um, have a look at um, what people feel about this, let's have a look at the, the, the history and the biology of these birds, see how they actually operate in the environment, <clears throat> certainly listen to their voices, which is quite interesting. Um, it's a process where you start to um, uh, find out the stories. And so you begin by layering in many people's stories, because there'll be many people in that community for whom these birds remind them of home somewhere. Um, then we suddenly realise that most of the birds in that community are also immigrants, and they've come with different populations over time. Um, you know, the blackbird that sings to some of us um, is obviously come from Europe and so on. Um, so you start to uh, think not in, not in conflictual terms, but you think in story-based terms. Because one of the things about stories, they're always more complex, because they're metaphors. They're always more complex than literal descriptions. So I don't know this, but you know, if you, 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 I would always start with the word, it sound, the word itself. And it will turn out to be... You know, forgive me for my ignorance, but let's say in Bengali, it means you know, the bird of sorrow. Um, now, because we're intentional creatures, we imme oh, it immediately rethinks, and it starts to fit, and then we know, we start to look at some of the local stories that have to do with the significance of you know, the white cockatoo or the local... Suddenly we begin to see that what we thought was an oppositional character um, can fit into any number of storytelling traditions as the stranger at the feast, uh, the trickster, and gradually we begin to see that, no, there's a possibility of thinking differently about how we manage our relationship to the non-human non environment. Uh, and instead of uh, directing our aggression and our sense of uh, invasion towards one particular scapegoat, we start to diversify it into an understanding that to some degree we all have common ground with that bird. Um, and the fact that it's, it's um, intrusive, um, la intrusa, it's the same word as death. So we start to think like that. People start to grow together, to build together, and they start to think in that way around, well, how do we now build sustaining narratives that confront the problem? Um, I don't have any solution to the problem, but that would be the approach I would take. Yes. Michael. Uh, Two-part question. Uh, first one is for you. Uh, why haven't you used post-colonial governance? Uh, is it because of the poetics of process that leads you to whatever that would be in the future? And the second part of the question is uh, governance. Um, you both worked in with local government, or you work with local government. Yeah. But yeah. your experience in Warrnambool was with uh, local government mm. and uh, and regional art uh, institution, the gallery there. Uh, what are the problems, um, John, from a government's point of view, of having a gallery inside or operated by a local government for the decolonialising practice? Yeah, well, I'd be interested to hear what you have to say about that. I'll answer very briefly. It wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't um, I'm not an expert in the theorisation of these terms. But for me, decolonising was, was a better term because it, it sounded like an action. Yeah. It sounded like a process, and you, 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 you partly indicated that. You ca it's hard to talk about post colonialising mm -hmm. government, you know. So post colonialism does tend to imply a state, I guess leaving aside all the other nuances it may have, which I don't know about. But to me, decolonizing was very clear. Um, you, were, you were subtracting uh, something from the colonial system. And, it was, and what the book tries to do is to uh, give you um, a set of um, stories, um, anecdotes, histories, and analyses that are about the process of doing it. Um, it's not a theoretical book in that sense. Of course, it's you know, full of... It has its own poetic arcana. Poetic arcana, but um, but basically no, it's not. It's 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 about a process that's that 
um, for which I have no particular endpoint. Yeah. John. Uh, you've actually just gone into local government again, haven't you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it's an issue of governance. When I came to Warrnambool in 2011, um, what I didn't realise is that um, Australia hadn't signed the UN, uh, U 1980 UNESCO resolution on the status of the artist and protection of cultural heritage. It, di it didn't sign it until 2016. And what they did that was that was created to stop totalitarian regimes using art for their own mean, uh -huh. means, whether it's fascism or communism or whatever. So it says that, that the uh, decisions made on culture must stand outside of any local government or any structure of government. What they can do is provide the funds and a governance oversight, but they cannot get involved in the process. So what we discovered when we were trying to build this vision in Warrnambool, that we actually didn't have the authority. They were looking at it from a procurement model, while we were looking at a visionary model. That, you know, so they saw the, the functions of artists just putting on shows, how many people through the door, did you pay the bills? You know, so it's you know it's very diff different. But well, we were actually turning that modeling around, and looking at the Western districts to a sense of invisible dynamics. What are the invisible dynamics inherent there, which you can actually feel and experience by watching birds? Yeah, you know, but you need to you know look at that. And using the art gallery simply as a jumping off point, a point of a frisson of energy that would begin to animate those conversations. So the dialogue would turn into a dialectic, and then we have something of, of, to build on change. So the problems we were was simply the structures. Now, in, in saying that, um, we, you know, I'm back in local government again, but uh, we've actually removed those, con those construction, or those structures we've had on it. We have much more freedom in that. And that's what we've been doing the last year. What I've been doing, and, and the people who work with me is changing that system. Therefore, when we do jump, you know, with Paul or, or whomever, we actually have a different model. But also in, the, in regards to a type of governance structure in there, um, how do you speak to community? Um, so you know, what we have uh, instituted in, in, in the city of Melbourne is uh, an advisory panel that was co-chaired by uh, a tradition owner and has an Aboriginal caucus of experts, uh, and Paul's on that as well, uh, and they advise us uh, on how we deal with community. And that's an, an episodic thing. Uh, as we try to build a model of governance um, through this uh, decolonization process, because we understand that by 2022, the state of Victoria will have treaty, whatever that means, and whatever that actually means to community, I'm not sure. It might m make a lot of us feel a bit better, but I'm not sure how they would feel about it. But then, of course, concession, there was this con just different kind of model there, that w which we hadn't really expected. Michael, if that makes sense. <coughs> Short first question. Uh, do you know about the New Zealand story? Tell us. Oh, well, I'm just wondering because, uh, well, which um, part of New Zealand? Well, just our, our, our own colonising story, our own post colonial story, <coughs> or decolonising story in the Treaty of Waitangi. I was wondering if you'd. If you'd uh, yeah, well, I'm uh, indeed. It's not. Um, sorry, it's not in the book. <laughs> um, yes. But yeah, of course, of course. But well, what. I was yeah. In, Well, it wasn't. It was a, um, a sin of omission rather than commission. Um, there are many places that weren't in it. Um, I know the South Africans have been pretty angry with me recently, but no, um, not to be fearless. No, that my 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 choice is. I mean, there is actually an important New Zealand story in it, which actually um, is talking about a, a particular performance in Auckland Harbour, which seems to capture what's possible post Waitangi. But it's only a small passage. But I'm not defending that. Um, no, the, the choice of um, case studies was quite personal in a way, but it was also that I wanted to focus on oceanic uh, archipelagos that, were under, that had a particular uh, contrasting <coughs> experience under colonialism. And you're right, it was influenced by the fact I was working in Northern Australia. Um, but um, no, there wasn't, the intention was not to, to exclude. I mean, there was one, I mean, there was one, it was a temptation to be honest, to extend uh, the close analysis of different geographical regions, including obviously New Zealand, but not New Zealand 
in its aloneness, but New Zealand in relation to um, the Western Pacific as well, and its own whole history of you know, multiple immigrations and so on. But I do touch on that. I mean, there's some discussion about an oceanic poetics that comes out of Hawaii, but you know, which is actually related genealogically to to some of the ways that stories are told about um, coming to New Zealand. But you know, that's, that's a bit yeah. Well, I'm just I'm just wondering if there is quite a natural. Um, a real difference perhaps between the New Zealand story and the Australian. I'm just wondering if there are there real big differences or are there similarities, you know, between our processes that we're going through and the Australian experience. Look, I think that's a huge question. I'm not sure I want to get into it because I, I don't have enough information, but, but Melinda does. <laughs> M- Melinda was going to suggest that that might be a really good one to hit him up for over a glass of wine. Well, <laughs> and the other question is, and this is how I, I kind of, I, I'm interested in your metaphoric and, and, and deduction as perhaps <coughs> the differences between the, 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 the world views perhaps. Um, I use, and I'm not sure whether it's kind of term, and I think it's been um, dismissed, but I use a left brain, right brain disparity. Do you think there's any validity in, in that distinction? Oh, well, uh, again, this is an, I think this is another conversation over a glass of wine. I mean, um, very briefly, uh, in a structuralist model of uh, cognition, yes, left-right does matter a great deal. But I think more... Um, so naturally there's a reaction against that notion of hard wiring across the hemispheres. I'm very interested in the synaptic part, where things constantly morph across. Um, and as you know from you know, reading New Scientist or Googling it these days, there's an immense amount of uh, medical information about the extraordinary things the the brain is able to do in terms of compensating for what happens on one half and the other half. I'm not in a position to say anything sensible about that, um, except that it's it's, uh, evident that um, these two, shall we say, zones uh, are able to talk to each other and transform across each other. Um, Yeah. But thank you for asking two questions I couldn't answer. No one. <laughs> it, it's a rare thing to be able to leave Paul Carter with a question that he can't answer. I think it's quite a nice way to end the night, if that's not too cheeky a suggestion. Paul, you've been extraordinarily uh, fulsome and generous in your um, engagement this evening. Um, thank you very, very much to Priya and to John for being a part of this. Thanks to all of you very much for coming along and please do now come and, and have a glass of and wine with us if you would like to. to. just take copies. They're there to be taken, really. Yeah. 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 Sorry. Sorry. Oh, no, 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 no. Shit, here, just took over.